Hi, welcome to episode 2 of our series, Can We Beat the Treasure of the Midnight Isle roguelike DLC for Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous using only one class. In specific, we are going to try and beat the DLC with Kineticist only. Now, I won't go over every detail of the run and the class like I did in the first episode, so if you're unfamiliar with the topic and you want a clearer picture of the video, I recommend you go see the first video before this one. I will make a little recap anyway, just to give some context. Kineticist is a powerful class that can specialize in manipulating certain elements. In our team, we got a leader, Sir McMuffin, a water kinetic knight that uses his sword of ice to deal damage in melee and function as the tank for the group. Then, we have our beautiful damage dealers that fight from distance. Tora the Hunter, with her element of earth, and the Burning Estel with the element of fire. They both deal great damage, but Estel is more accurate and hits more often, while Tora Rock Throws are less accurate but deal more damage on impact. The DLC map is composed of different islands with one dungeon inside that must be completed in order to proceed to the next island. At the end of Archipelagos, there's a more difficult island with a boss fight in its dungeon, and then the game repeats until you reach the final archipelago. I guess? I never actually reached that point as I'm continuously starting out new games to try new builds and party compositions. I am that kind of chaotic player that never reached the end of something because they quickly change their minds on how they want to play. But this time I promise I will keep my focus and complete the challenge. Or at least try my best until I find an insurmountable wall or something. With all of this said, Let's delve into a little adventure. In the previous video we completed the first archipelago and beat the first boss. All our characters are ready to level up to level 4, as I'm sure I already shown on screen. But more importantly, after a boss fight you get to go back to the island of Alushinira, where you won't find the dungeon, but instead you'll find a trader and the possibility to rest on safe ground and reduce the effect of chaos on our characters in the form of the Abyssal Corruption. You get also the chance to recruit a new companion, in our case for the price of 3000 gold, a steep price but one we are willing to pay, for a new group member Moonlight will join us. I decide to make Moonlight another dwarf, so now we have 4 dwarves, yay! She is another kinetic knight as I feel Sir McMuffin could use a little bit of company in the front line. She uses the element of lightning. Not because it's particularly good for a kinetic knight, but first it looks cool as hell. And second, that's the element we were missing in our party, and I wanted to diversify the damage, even if, uh, as we will see later on with the video, it isn't actually necessary. I pay a visit to the trader as well, and buy some new armor and all the healing potions I can buy. I'm not committing the same mistake I made last time. And now, we are ready to embark toward the next archipelago. As I said in the previous video, all dungeons have a peculiar randomized theme. The theme of these islands is kobolds. I am relieved, as I feel something more dangerous might have come in our way. We go through the dungeon as a hot knife through butter. Our kineticist, pro our kineticist party proved extremely good in dealing damage, and our newest addition, Moonlight, while not perfectly optimized for tanking, Proves to be pretty good at it nonetheless, and deals good damage just as the others. Sir McMuffin instead proves again to be a wonderful tank, thanks to its new ability Shroud of Water, which envelops him in water, raising its armor class further. It's not a good day for these fruit kobolds, we slaughter the whole tribe with ease. We even find some gelatinous cube, but even they are not worth the opponents at this point. The biggest threat is traps which is also really fitting with the Cobalt team, if you think about it. Anyway, we reach the end of the dungeon, and there we find something marvelous, a mysterious object that through the help of the Elsman will grant us mythical path levels. Now, if you don't know what mythic levels are, they are essentially a separate leveling mechanic introduced in Wrath of the Righteous that lets character take mythical powers that greatly enhance their capabilities. In our case, we decide to take the Ascendant Element Mythic Power for almost all of our heroes, as this talent makes the elemental damage 
from a certain type of element you can choose irresistible. So in the future, if we face enemies that can resist the elements, we can nullify the resistances. And seeing how it goes in the base game, I expect to find them pretty soon. Also, our main character, Mr. Sir McMuffin, gets to choose a mythic part ability and can align with different powers of the multiverse. We decide to align with power of the older, and so we get some not so useful, in my opinion, abilities in detecting illusions. Later on, as you will see, this will grant us greater abilities that I think will complement well our playstyle with him. On the second island, the theme is Demonic Cultist. Now, I am a little bit scared, as this cultist proved to be able to deal a higher amount of damage than, than what we faced before. Barbarians are especially scary. Luckily, their accuracy sucks, and our tanks do the job pretty well. All in all, I realized I was scared mostly for nothing. This cultist go down pretty fast with the incredible amount of damage we deal thanks to our recent level up. We also find some good loot that I will probably sell to buy more healing potions. This game can be rough on your health points. The island goes pretty smoothly, and we acquire the bounty of Reflex. All our characters' reflex saving throws are increased by one permanently, meaning they will be able to dodge incoming damage from sources like fireballs or some traps more easily. Neat! We level up some more and take some CC abilities with most of our characters. I am especially counting on Tora the Hunter ability to now trip the enemies when they are hit by her rocks. That will be glorious and extremely useful at the same time, as they get knocked out for a bit, and when they try to get up, they will trigger attacks of opportunity by all of our midi knights, dealing incredible damage, or at least that's my plan. We will see if it works. On to the third island we go. The theme is again Pulpis, but this time we spot some Cambians, lesser demons that look like humans but with demonic wings. At this level, they are pretty scary, especially thanks to their elemental resistance. I am so glad we took the mythic ability that nullifies the resistance as we deal with them pretty easily. The cultist cambions mix make for, a great, for great and fun fights. This island was especially fun to go through even if it wasn't much of a challenge in the end. We got more experience points as a reward and we push further. <laughs> now, the first island was a thing of its own. You see, as you progress towards more difficult islands, delving deeper into the demonic seas, the chaotic influence of demonic planes becomes stronger, manifesting itself through the alteration of the island, leading to unique type of dungeon with passive effects that are mostly dangerous. Think of it as encountering more extreme atmospheric effects as you get further and further from the continent's coastline, but magical and unpredictable in nature. The island is under the influence of one of these so-called cows, and so the exploration is more difficult. We get the flying time under Tau. The beginning of combat, everyone, even the enemies, is under the effect of the Haas spell. Pretty interesting. Might go well, might go very bad. In addition, all creatures begin to age rapidly. At the end of each turn, they age by one. As they age, they get smarter, and their mind gain experience, but their bodies get weaker. In other words, our characters age extremely fast and I suspect they might even just die if we spend too much time here. Knowing this, I kind of panic and decide to go through the dungeon as fast as possible, exploring just the minimum necessary. Oh, the team of this dungeon is Quidor again. Only one of us gets poisoned, and it works out alright with the dice rolls, so not too bad. But time is ticking, and our characters are getting older. At some point, they get so weak to be encumbered by the weight of their equipment and inventory. This is getting scary. Luckily, we reach the end of the dungeon and get our reward. This time, everyone gets a feat. They are better at resisting things like disarming or tripping 
when they are close to each other. Nothing crazy, but certainly appreciated. We finally reached the last island of the archipelago, the Boss Island, probably the most difficult island and the one I'm most scared of. My fear immediately finds confirmed when I realize this island is under the Anandertal as well. This time we get the totems of fire on the island, placed here and there. They summon fire elementals and when you are close to them you get an additional 1d4 damage every time you get damaged by something else. Really nasty. Look at this fight. This is when I realize what I just told you. Estel gets on the ground and the fight seems to go forever as the fire totems spawn more and more fire elementals. It was an amazing fight to play and I would say a pretty clutch one as the damage we were dealing was just enough to buy us the time to reach the totem and destroy it. I really enjoyed this fight. Anyway, we finally reached the boss fight. A realized mid fight, it's the boss fight. There's no arena this time, just a small room. Our adversary this time is a warrior in full armor wielding sword and shield. It immediately charges Estel, taking her down on the spot, but then it gets baited by her tanks. With the damage we still made even without Estel, it's over pretty soon. And so, we leave the island and get back to Alushinira, with some new valuable loot to sell and the level up waiting for us in the next episode. Yes, the next episode! I thought about making one longer video with the whole of the run in one episode, but I decided to keep doing, doing it like the first video. A little bit for a matter of consistency, so those of you who, um, who watched the first video wouldn't be overwhelmed, as you might have expected the video of similar length, and for my sanity, as these videos require a lot of me, and if you watch some of the other videos on the channel, you might already know why. I want to leave you with a thanks to Brandon Awesome8589, who left a comment in the previous video of the series, expressing interest in a sequel. It has been nice to get some feedback, and it really motivates me, motivated me into making the best sequel I could. I hope you appreciate it, and I leave you asking for your help. I feel like I planted a seed in the Pathfinder and Wolf community, something I'm really happy about. As you can see from my videos, I'm pretty passionate about it. Now it's the time to make that seed grow, so that I can make more content like this and you get to watch it. So, if you will, just interact with the video, leave a like and share if you want. I would also be glad to receive more feedback like last time, and I wouldn't refuse tips or critics. Also, if you like this video, there's a pretty high chance you will like my video on the first minutes of Baldur's Gate 3. Tell me what you like more, Baldur's Gate 3 or Pathfinder the Wrath of the Righteous? I am really curious to know. See you the next time, bye!